Why is this so critical? You're struggling with this, the whole world is struggling with this. So suicide is one of the world's greatest public health crises. It actually accounts for more deaths than war, homicide, and natural disasters combined. It's a leading cause of death across the world, across ages, every 40 seconds across the globe, every 13 minutes in the United States, somebody dies. It's now more recently become the number one cause of injury and mortality in the United States, surpassing car accidents. And, and Dr. Insel, the head of NIMH, calls it the under-recognized public health crisis of suicide. But the good news as we just heard, is that it's actually our, prevent our one preventable cause of death. We just need to keep working hard. Prevention depends upon appropriate identification and screening. If we can't find the people suffering in silence, right, we certainly, we certainly can't help them. But the problem has been that medicine and even psychiatry has been challenged by a lack of clarity as to what to call things. And corresponding to that, we've had no well-defined terminology, which has very much cut across research and clinical settings across the world. So what happens is the same exact occurrence gets called 16 different things. Suicide attempt, not a suicide attempt, threat, gesture. And often those labels are pejorative, manipulative, non-serious but actually based on incorrect notions as to the relationship between seriousness and lethality. So somebody hears, oh, she only took three pills, we shouldn't call that suicidal, when the data actually tells us something else. Now, you guys remember all the controversies with medications and do they cause people to be suicidal? So, by the way, this is a talk I'll come back for another time. Medications do not cause people to be suicidal. It's quite the opposite. But I was the person that led the team that was commissioned by the FDA to help make sense of that data. And when FDA had this very critical question to answer, they found this somebody somewhere called a slap in the face a suicide attempt. Now, clearly a slap in the face should not be called a suicide attempt, but what it shows you, it's not about doctors or nurses or drug companies covering things up, because it shouldn't be called that. It's about the fact that there's been no training or standardization in the field in how to do this, and clearly that has negative implications on how we manage. If we can't properly identify, we certainly can't understand, manage, or treat, no matter where we're trying to do so. And it, of course, not only impacts regulatory safety questions, it limits our confidence in epidemiological statistics, right? Because if everybody's defining things differently, how can we compare across counties, cities, states, countries? Now, the good news I'll show you is that the CDC has also adopted this now, so we're making progress. But this problem has had its tentacles in lots of different places. And this is actually a quote from the Institute of Medicine highlighting this problem I'm talking about as one of our major impediments to suicide prevention efforts in general. So that's how we get to this scale. Actually, the FDA requires this scale now across medicine, so people misunderstand that we're actually, um, we created it for them. It happened many years before that. We were helping to run the first NIMH treatment of adolescent suicide attempter study, even though it's the second or third leading cause of death in that age group. We had never had a large intervention trial to look at how to help them. So in this very important national effort, we had every scale for suicide and depression, and the experts said, there's nothing to do this. There's nothing to put ideation and behavior together or look at the full range or density or track change. So we created it to fill this gaping hole in the field and it took 20 years of science. So it's a collaboration with Beck's group. Most of you are, for many of you are familiar with their scales. Columbia had the only thing, 20 years supported by 100 studies to look at behavior. And now it's, you know, they say the, the most evidence-supported thing ac across the globe, but it's also really low burden. When you do what I call the whole thing, you'll see there's a toolkit. It takes just a few minutes, and, we, and then there's one with just a few questions. But we got together as authors and said, what's the minimum amount of information we'd want to track in any setting, whether it's a medical ED, a school, or an army base? And one of the 
very useful things about it is that you do not need to be a mental health professional to administer the scale. And there's lots of good data to support that. So in a behavioral healthcare setting, anybody, literally there are hospitals where, you know, custodial staff are being trained, but all kinds of gatekeepers are able to do this. Doesn't mean that they're gonna do an in-depth assessment. They're just gonna be able to identify who needs to go to the next step in places where they may be the only one who could find them. And I, I just, you know, wanted to, to tell you a story. I went and trained a Hindu temple in Schenectady, New York. Very disadvantaged population, very high suicide rate. I trained the priests and the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the high school kids. And two weeks later, there was an article in the newspaper, this grandmother who was at the training, her grandson walked in, didn't look very good. She asked the questions and it said probably saved his life. So we're in a place where we believe that everybody everywhere can ask and, and should ask. We were in Washington State a few weeks ago. There was a murder-suicide in an American Indian tribe. All gatekeepers, but my team went into the schools and worked with the kids and every, every talk, yes, I made a suicide attempt, help me, right? you can really put this in the hands of the entire community. So I, I've been showing this slide for many years and it, it kind of shows in this very bottom up way. I mean, we heard from, you know, the Israeli Defense Force, Health Canada, you know, crisis negotiation, claims, you name it, they started coming to us. But now top down has started to meet bottom up, which is great. And some of the first states that went, went fully top-down made this really important point about the linking of systems. When you're doing the same thing, inpatient, bridge, outpatient, community, you're going to quicken care to the people who need it. Tennessee said it's so important that the school nurse is going to be doing the same thing as the EMT, as the hospital. And so I've been showing that slide for a long time, but now we're getting real-world examples. So New York State is one of the first top-down states you guys know what an ACT team is, right? I guess that's a common term. So this is a quote from the ACT teams in New York. It's made such a big difference. Historically, the issue used to be turfed out to the psychologist. Now, the entire team is taking responsibility for it and wanting to take responsibility for it. And as a result, the conversations are much more team-wide and robust with greater clarity and ultimately greater, greater client care. And so this is the way it's getting rolled out. So you'll see in a minute, Georgia you know, started first, provider by provider, all services between services and in systems of care. And it starts with the Department of Health or Mental Health. And then all of these other systems actually link in, which is, which is really critical. This is an organizational vision of what a community can do and what many communities um, are doing. And so this is yet just another example. So there's at NYU, Every medical provider, every orthopedic resident, surgeon, everybody that walks in that hospital, no matter what specialty, are doing, are doing the screen. And you get all these endorsements, you know, which is good when you, when you are doing something, um, SAMHSA, but I wanted to mention something about joint commission. So it's, it's best practices, but joint commission came to me and asked me to, to present, and, work with them on, on what they're trying to do. And at the behavioral health once a year meeting for joint commission, I'm told, you know, they got up and said, there may be other things, but, but there's one thing that we really, you know, that gets you what you need. And they connected it to what joint commission is asking for in 16 different ways. And you'll hear me talking a lot about the redirecting of resources. And the person said, oh my gosh, so this is really going to impact those unnecessary ED holds, you know, so we can actually care for people in a better way. And then remember I said that the CDC has adopted this, so that's great. This is the CDC document, Self-Directed Violence, and you can see this is our definitions. You see Posner et al., and this is um, a, a link to the scale, to the CSSRS. However, as importantly, this is also from the CDC document, the unacceptable terms the terms we shouldn't be using anymore. You see gesture, threat, these are terms you see thrown around probably all the time still. You know, a threat or a gesture could refer to 15 different things, you know, that we assess. There's no rhyme or reason. And you can see completed suicide, successful suicide. 
you know, you complete something that you want to finish. You know, there's a positive connotation that they want to take away from suicide. So we just say died, died by suicide. So what this is doing is really moving us towards a more meaningful common language, which is very, very critical. So what is, what the heck is this scale? It's simply a one to five rating for suicidal thoughts of increasing severity. It's always as little as these two questions for suicidal thoughts. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up or have you actually had thoughts of killing yourself? If it's no to those questions, there are no suicidal thoughts. So they move on to the behavior question or questions. Behavior, very importantly, fixes all the problems we've seen in the past. Most, most, most importantly, it covers the full range of behavior for the very first time. We were all trained in just asking about a suicide attempt. And then you miss the person who bought the gun yesterday, or put the noose around their neck and changed their mind, or wrote the suicide note. Things we absolutely cannot afford to miss. And you see, it's the first thing with definitions. Remember that IOM quote about the importance of definitions? And standardized questions for each category to make your identification the easiest and quickest that, that as quick as it needs to be. So toolkit, again. So this is our full CSSRS, which I said only takes a few minutes. It's a one through five, which is in everything, and then a few additional questions that I'll talk about, and the back page is behavior. And this is the screener. And they get used in you know, together in compilation with each other. And so again, you start with those two questions. Have you actually had thoughts of killing yourself? If that, if that question is yes, then somebody gets asked the next questions. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? Do you intend to carry out this plan? You can't have a method or intent or a plan and intent, right, if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. That's why those questions are subcategories of the other one. So it's really a minimum of two and then people screen in. They always do the one to two ideation questions and the behavior question on the screener. But, it, but again, it's a toolkit and actually people can mix and match and decide what's best for their system. So. We also have something called the risk assessment version you see over here on the side. And what that has are the risk and protective factors on the front page that the authors felt were warranted by the evidence. So for a, a, a provider who wants to get a more in-depth assessment of risk factors, they can, they can pull that version out. But Tennessee decided in their crisis assessment tool, they use the screener. And then they put that page on the front. Because if a guy, a policeman or an EMT goes to a call and they can't get any information from the identified person at risk or the, or the spouse, they want to make sure that they looked at the, um, at the risk factors. Now, every single thing on this scale is there because it speaks to risk. If you just take one behavior, a preparatory behavior, collecting pills, buying a gun, writing a will or suicide note, just that one behavior, Somebody was eight to 10 times more likely to end their life. We did an analysis with, with Beck. And look at, and this data, this data is really important. This is 35,000 non-suicidal depressed adults using a phone system, self-report that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more later. But the, so the good news is the worrisome answers, the answers that you have to act on are pretty rare, 1%. You see less than 1% with 50,000. But isn't it important to get better identification of these high-risk people? Look at these numbers. Only 13% of that 1% were actual attempts. All the others were the things we were never asking about before. That means that the overwhelming majority of serious suicidal behaviors that individuals at risk are going to engage in are things we were not not even assessing, okay? And look at this. We now have data that every one of those behaviors is equal, equally or more predictive than a suicide attempt. This, we always knew that the full range felt clinically very important, but I would not even have anticipated how, how critically important it was. And another reason that we created the scale was to look at density. You know, we know that multiple attempters are more at risk than single attempters, but there's not a lot of great data. 
Look at this, as you add each behavior on the CSSRS, the risk goes up proportionally. So the predictive scientific support of this scale is really confirming, you know, a lot, a lot of this work. And then remember, I, sh I showed you the the in the toolkit we have a full version. So they ask that one through five, and then they ask a few additional questions: frequency, duration, you know, deterrence. That is a range of two to twenty-five. Look at these numbers. When you get to a twenty-one to twenty-five, the risk ratios are thirty-four-fold. So these few questions can really help us add add to a uh, to somebody's risk profile. And I want to I want to tell you when I went and trained. I, I said there's a toolkit, right? So I went and trained the Ohio hospital system, and they the the medical emergency department who was the pilot got up there and told a story how they started with the screen and they moved to the full version because they think it's the most important thing they do in the medical ED. And they told a story about a guy who drove into a wall. And they did the CSSRS and he said, yes, I tried three other times, but I stopped before I hit the wall and nobody's ever asked me these questions before. And he was so happy to be asked the questions and all of a sudden with a few questions they had a much better risk profile of this person and ultimately, uh, of course, you know, much better uh, intervention plan. Now, remember I said 1%, so I went and trained the Detroit VA system. Many, many, many VAs across the nation are using this and they've adopted all the definitions and they say this is what, you know, we want you to use. But they said to me, we love this scale, we can't wait to use it, but don't ever think we're gonna get 1%. We're a VA. So they did a study of the more high-risk vets, the vets that were going to see their psychiatrist. And only 14 of the 3,000 screened positive, and only five required more acute care. And what the d head of that hospital said is, what that said to us programmatically and in terms of redirecting resources was incredible. And this was another quote from somebody, you know, Ensuring the necessary steps were taken to safeguard an individual or return them back home with support, it can help avoid unnecessary hospitalization or save a life, which I think is a very uh, telling statement. Now, another thing is that people assume when you start to ask these questions across the board in primary care or a school or a hospital, you're going to increase burden, understandably. But actually, the data is pointing in the opposite direction. So. How many of you know what the PHQ-9 is? Okay, a lot of you. So it's used globally, you know, especially in primary care. It's a fantastic scale for the other symptoms of depression. But the suicide item says thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way. First of all, we don't consider better off dead to be anything. When I say we, NIMH, Columbia, Bex Group, we have a working group. The only thing that's ever been evidence supported is a wish to die. Beck has shown that if you have a wish to die, you're six times more likely to end your life over a 20 year period. So this sets you up for false positives. Hurting yourself can be self mutilation or suicidal behavior, also false positives. And we have lots of settings where we see that, where, you know, when you ask the right questions, you do away with cases that should have never been called suicidal in the first place. So this is beautiful data. Cleveland Clinic went policy a long time ago. Look at, look at these numbers at Cleveland Clinic. They got 24% positive screens, according to that one PHQ-9 question, versus 6.2% with a few additional questions on the CSSRS, while they found cases that would have been missed. So it's a great example of the win-win nature, we think, you know, dramatic reduction of false positives while you're uniquely identifying. And then just lots more data. What's the difference between asking a few semi-structured or structured questions versus just relying on what you think those questions should be? So this was a National Emergency Department safe, safety study using the telephone CSSRS, using it within a telephone assessment, increased detection by, by 40%, by 40%. And I would say, importantly, that one of the CSSRS's greatest contributions is its impact on care delivery and service utilization. And the reason that it's able to do that is because it has operationalized criteria for next steps, whatever those next steps are. 
right? Triggering referral to a mental health professional, putting on one-to-one, -one, whatever it may be. And you know what that's doing? That's decreasing a tremendous amount of unnecessary interventions. Because in the past, nobody knew who to worry about. So you'd hear any answer, a wish to die or whatever, and walk to an ER or put on one-to-one -one because you had to protect people. And this, for ideation, is what that threshold is, what we call a four and a five. The difference between a three and a four is a three is I could take pills, I could jump off the bridge, but I'd never do anything about it. When you get to a four, they say, I can't tell you if I'm gonna do something about it. You have some indication of suicidal intent, and then a five is intent with a specific plan. So that some of this incredibly robust science has really supported our a priori thoughts that intent to act is what we needed to get at. Not plan, intent, intent to act. Okay. So, 100, 116 languages, including a lot of languages that are, you know, pertinent to your own, to your own uh, community. Um, all gatekeepers, very, you know, been given tens of millions of times across the world with great feasibility for improvement as well as for safety. You can go on the website. Everybody can get trained in every way, shape, and form. Very, very great acceptance by providers and by patients. And this is important. It's just as important to have innovative and feasible delivery as it is to have the right questions. So people are doing laminated cards, metal keychains, apps on phones, portable printers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this is one of the things that I really wanted to talk about. This is this phone system, and it's on a computer too. So what happens is somebody picks up the phone, they get asked the questions with a human voice. They press the buttons for the answers. It's connected to two call centers. And there's immediate transfer of information to whomever needs it. And if they get one of those scary answers, the bells and whistles don't go off until there's acknowledgment of receipt. So I always talk about this as a critical piece of an optimal prevention plan. First of all, it's like pilots and surgeons with their checklists. You know, you never get a question missed and that ends up saving lives. We also get greater sensitivity with self-report, but more importantly, it allows us to address gaps that we have not been able to address. Post-discharge suicide, right? Great, big, huge problem in suicide prevention that we haven't known how to manage. Imagine this, somebody can be discharged, call from his bed one, one week post-discharge, two weeks post-discharge. It gives us a way to monitor for risk that we've never been able to do before. In New Jersey, they're adopting this throughout the school system. They talk about the summer being a time of increased risk for kids, drinking, taking drugs. You don't get to see them. Imagine this, a kid can call in from his cell phone, you know, in July, and it gives us a way to get at risk that we just have not been able to do before. And, ha and however, this is a much lower tech version of the CSSRS. This is a poster that a National Guard did. Have the courage to help a buddy, have you or someone you know, and then it has all the questions. This could be in a school, in a primary care office. These things do not replace each other, they complement each other. So we paper a community with all every and all version and way to do this, you know, wh what and, and decide what's appropriate where. And it's also, people always ask, how often should I be asking these questions? And what is gold standard and what we recommend is every visit, whatever the heck that means. Because God forbid, remember this can be one question, two questions. It's semi-structured. Have you had any of those thoughts or done any of those things? The screeners, two questions. So God forbid the time you needed to ask is the time you didn't ask. Right, so the cost benefit is very clear. One of the greatest interventionists in the nation, Dr. Stanley, she says, in a treatment visit, if you have time to do one thing and one thing only, it's ask these questions. And I'll never forget that Detroit VA that I told you about. When I went to train them, they hadn't implemented yet. Their most recent suicide, 67-year-old guy, lots of risk factors, the therapist had asked questions on the phone, the typical ones, are you having suicidal thoughts? He said no. Upon his death, they found out that this guy was putting clothes in bags, labeling them for different charities, stockpiling food for his pet. Six months of clear preparations. Remember, that's a question. 
on the form. So it became clear to the system that if they had been asking the questions, they would have had a better chance at least of, as of saving this guy's life. And we have lots of examples that we'll share, many state, country, you know, agencies. So this is the whole prison system in Australia and New Zealand. When the guard does it, you do this version. When the provider does it, you do that. You know, the, all the triaging examples. This is, um, this is New York State for psychiatric care, you know, with next steps, with high risk. So we have a great arsenal of, of policies and procedures in every ask to help with every aspect of the community. It also can be tailored for to address population specific questions. So there's a pediatric version, you know, that doesn't ask about a will because typically six year olds don't write wills or it says how to make yourself not alive anymore. This was a suicide cluster in upstate New York. And this was a different demographic. It was African-American females, and it was a gang-related precipitant. These girls were trying to get out of gangs, and they couldn't, and instead they were taking their lives. So in that case, the state wanted to know. We added some questions to find out if, if that trigger was related to subsequent issues. And this is what the military can do. You see legal troubles, financial troubles, state of service. You see this question? Sometimes a person can feel that others close to them, e.g. family, would be better off financially if the person is no longer alive. Have you experienced this? Because you know, people are actually taking their lives in the army because of the financial meaning it has. My, my colleagues there say they hear all the time a quote, you're better off to me dead. So there are many examples of this, you know, prison when you miss a visit. So lots of lots of additional things can be used and added. And we also know that screening works. You know, we know that Dr. Mann, who's an author on the CSSRS, has a seminal article in JAMA showing that screening results in lower suicide rates. You know, college campuses, presidents, college presidents worry so much, understandably, about the liability of suicide. But you know, a history of a suicide attempt is the number one risk factor. Ask a few questions when they come in for their health screens. It will go a tremendous way towards prevention. This is one study, but I'd bet my bottom dollar we'd see it everywhere. One, this is AFSP, one suicide in four years post-screening versus three you know, pre-screening. Pre and we're like a 24-7 consultation center. And then my, my final thing I wanna say is that the thought leaders have been saying that it's actually good that we're moving to do one thing the science and the public health demand that kind of uniformity. When you don't use one single thing, you, you degrade the precision of the signal you're trying to get at, and that grows when you're talking about something with low incidence, like suicidal ideation and behavior. And this, remember I said the FDA asks for this scale? So they, they this is a quote from the FDA's guidance. It should be noted that use of different instruments is likely to increase measurement variability, which you know you can't afford for, for something like this. Okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to share with you today, and I um, am really excited to be here, and I'm thrilled to open it up for questions now, okay?